My name is Kate Stewart, and I've been focusing on how we can make embedded systems dependable here at the Linux Foundation. That's been my focus. Um, SPDX is one aspect, and you'll see why. But um, making these things dependable is part of what we're going to have to care about going forward, I think. So with the security threats emerging every week that you've been hearing about, there are implications for critical infrastructure systems. And I've been studying these and wanted to share with you some of this information today. So, this one. Okay, software development today is based on open source. It's been, we've been seeing this pretty much since 2018. But we need to look at some of the trends to understand what this is going to mean for critical infrastructure systems in the years ahead. First trend. Open source is increasingly part of software products. Um, from the SCA analysis tools reports and the studies that we've been doing at the Linux Foundation, we've seen the increase in the amount of the code bases that contain open source software components, as well as an increase in the percentage of the products, the lines of code in the products that are open source. So we've seen this increase um, in the components per application, and mostly as a result of dependencies of what the software is being included. The growing use of containers is also a factor here as well. Um, open, the next trend is open source is increasingly part of embedded systems. Um, for embedded software, it's hard to find the data, okay? It, there isn't nice stats everywhere <laughs> to pull from. Um, but from some of the studies I've managed to get that are public, <laughs> as a, um, about 69% of the embedded systems are running on Linux. And when you're running on Linux, um, there's other open source components there. And so, as you can sort of see from here, these are getting into some of the critical infrastructures areas. Okay? And the other thing that's important to note is IoT, even in 2019, was a large part of the embedded ecosystem. And there's some interesting challenges there. So the next trend to talk about is, according to the UN, there's about 8 million people, oh, sorry, 8 billion people on this planet as of the start of this month. Um, by 2026, we're sort of heading towards two IoT devices for every person on this planet. Um, from the study that was uh, published by Arne Holst in 2020, August 2021, the estimates are that we're looking to forecast almost triple um, the number of Internet of Things devices of 8 billion in 2020 to 25.4 billion in 2030. And the other thing that was interesting from this information was major industry verticals that currently have more than 100 million IoT devices, so each of these verticals has 100 million, um, are electricity, gas, steam, steam and you know, air conditioning, water supply and waste management, retail wholesale, transportation, storage, and government. Again, a lot of these are industry verticals that are part of several countries' critical infrastructures. And then another trend that we saw is the critical infrastructure cybersecurity awareness is growing in the industry. Um, the problem is pretty much worldwide. We saw this in the US last year, but you can see from these, it was in other countries as well, Brazil, India. Um, it's, it's not just in one country or something like that. We've got vulnerabilities there. We've got people trying to exploit this because they can make money by exploiting these vulnerabilities. And so figuring this out um, is going to be a challenge for all of us. And in fact, if you look at other, the other organizations that have safety critical applications that also hit into some of these critical infrastructures. Um, these are where the vulnerabilities are being found. And these are where we're going to need to make sure we keep the supply chain solid, because people's lives are there. Now, one of the things I was really excited about this summer is um, Japan's NISC released the Cybersecurity Critical Infrastructure Action Plan that identified Japan's critical infrastructure areas and systems to bring focus onto this important subject. 
Fortunately for me, they translated into English. Now, these areas here, these critical infrastructure industry sectors include um, the ones that are listed here on there, but you'll see a lot of these are embedded systems that are coming into play. And what I also thought very um, insightful from this report was its emphasis on the relevant safety factors that need to be taken into account as well as the security remediations. The safety principles here, oops, sorry, there. These safety principles mean looking at the standards and adhering to that even if you fix something, it still is safe to use. And for critical infrastructure, this is going to be key because bugs aren't going to go away. So depending on each sector, though, and the applications, there are different standards that are engaged here and the risk levels that apply. But there are some under, you know, underlying commonalities across these standards we can all build on. All software being used needs to be known, tested, and managed over time. You just don't do it once and done. We have a time spectrum to take into account. This, you know, the infrastructure doesn't just change every day. Some things are like in place for like 20 years or longer. Oops, sorry, too many gadgets. <laughs> Anyhow, this brings us to our final trend to consider, that over the last couple of years, we've seen that open source is showing up in safety critical applications from automotive to civil infrastructure to aerospace to energy. We see organizations forming and common um, code in these markets, verticals. This trend started several years ago with automotive grade Linux possibly even carrier grade Linux before that, now that I think of it. Um, and more recently, we're seeing a lot of focus in the civil infrastructure project, LF networking, LF energy, and a variety of other embedded projects supported by Yocto. So we have common software building blocks like Linux kernel that's being used and reused in different ways pretty much through the ecosystem. This will allow us to share efficiencies and understand security and share um, fixes to the security and remediations. So there's positive directions here. But because of the safety critical implications and the national regulatory oversight that's emerging, um, NISC's, NISC's, sorry, cybersecurity policy for the critical infrastructure protection plan points, plan points out that there are useful factors to consider as a good starting point for all of us um, to understand more. So what is this going to mean for the evolution of open source software development? Well, um, since critical infrastructure tends to have safety considerations associated with them, safety standards provide a framework and factors to consider in the analysis of a system, both hardware and software in a system, that provides, is providing um, a specific safety-related function. Since software is more and more is being composed of open source components, there are some new challenges for the open source software development systems moving into these areas. So let's be clear, as Dan pointed out, um, closed source has the same challenges, if not more. However, companies with proprietary offerings have had the resources that fund the safety level analysis in the past and follow traditional methodologies that the standards are looking for. For software, though, that, um, that is being integrated in and put together some of these pieces have been missing. And this is what we need to focus on figuring out how to solve. So the challenge is how can we evolve the open source ecosystem to meet the challenges of being used in critical infrastructure where there are regulatory requirements and where there are safety critical implications. Some of the initial steps though um, that we can take um, to make this journey, we can start today. And so first off, Step is know exactly what you're using. <laughs> um, being able to automatically understand all the components of your system is going to be key. Um, this is where SBOMs come in. Being able to, you know, automatically at your fingertips have know exactly which components are sitting there on your deployed products. That is key for security and essential for doing safety analysis at scale for these modern systems. 
In the last year, um, the focal point of SBOM definition work has moved from, in the US from NTIA to CISA. And this is just sort of defining what is an SBOM. Um, and the multi-stakeholder meetings are continuing. Uh, there's weekly meetings, and Japan's CERT team is part of these discussions. Uh, there have been several meetings with them as well. But for us to get to scale, we're going to need international standards. And international standards um, as sharing the software metadata efficiently is key. SPDX is a language to convey the software components information, and it lets you scale down to the source file level, which is where we need to be for embedded. Okay, a certain um, knowing exactly which files are there or not there will tell us if we have to go and do a remediation in the field. Okay, the component version is a good starting point, but it's not sufficient. OpenChain also has been asking for a software bill of materials or a BOM um, as part of what you share between organizations to build trust between these organizations. And so it provides information on the processes of working with these um, information and sharing. So SPDX, in November 2021, SPDX became an international standard. And I would personally like to thank you, um, the ISO Japanese reviewing team, because they gave us the most detailed feedback and really helped us improve it when we went through ISO. Um, there were several nights and weekends <laughs> spent addressing their feedback, but they did give us a lot of really good detailed feedback that we made sure we could address. The open chain is also another international standard, and it has started building up industry-focused special interest groups in the last year. We've had automotive and telco, telecommunications. Um, the telecommunications and the transportations are areas that are considered for critical infrastructure. And I'm hoping you know, I've been talking to Shane, and I'm hoping to see more of the critical infrastructure verticals start to meet and share best practices. Because sharing these best practices within this critical infrastructure sector is going to be key to the adoption. Because you work with your peers and you understand the same language and the same concerns. So I'm hoping that Shane will be working on getting more of these special interest groups formed, and we can um, continue to collaborate that way. Um, next step is knowing how your software is built. From a security perspective, we've learned in the last few years that knowing your dependencies is essential. From the supply chain attacks starting to show up, the industry is also waking up to the fact that it's key to understand how it's built. Um, safety standards have been expecting to know how software is built for the last couple of decades. The information is there, the best practices are there, they're just translated into a form that um, we just need to build the bridge language gap a bit sometimes. The concepts, though, are solid. So LF pro um, projects focusing on building clarity here. Well, SPDX is a way of tracking dependencies to the source level for six years now. Um, there's a rich set of dependencies. You know, we've a, but we're evolving to the 3.0 version of the spec right now. And we're adding in an optional build profile to add further clarity on the building and for the software. There is also a security profile that's going to be incorporated and um, a usage profile. There is a team here in Japan that has been working on helping us to define what does it mean for risk analysis when you're using software in your system and be carrying, carrying some of that metadata as well. Um, another project that's working on this is the Octo project. As Dan was saying, we need to have this automated. Well, Yocto's automated it. Uh, one line config change um, in your scripts, and you can basically automatically generate SBOMs for your build tool chain, as well as the libraries it's built, as well as your final image. It all happens behind the scenes. It's there today in embedded projects that use Yocto. It's like I say, it's a one line change you have to turn on. And that's where we need to be across the ecosystem, and that's the type of changes that Dan was referencing. We need this to be behind the scenes. We need to make it easy for developers to just have the right things happening. Another um, project that's sort of working in this area is obviously OpenSSF. And Dan just talked about SigStore for provenance, and then there's also the Gitbomb project for um, having a verifiable component dependency graph, which is also useful as a cross-check. And then the, third, the last project I want to quickly chat on here is Zephyr. And Zephyr is an RTOS um, to use when Linux is too big. And it is able to um, automatically generate soft, um, software build materials for the sources and the built image 
and have the linkage between them, and again, as a result of one command. So if you're using Zephyr today, one command, you can have these SBOMs coming out automatically. I guess the next step is you need to be able to reproduce your builds. Um, security issues are being discovered all the time, so if a vulnerability shows up 20 years from now, can you fix it? The critical infrastructure needs to be maintainable and reliable over time. And so there is this need to be able to rebuild an executable image in the future times in order to apply a fix. So some of the LF projects that have been focusing on this aspect already are the Civil Infrastructure Platform, which has extended the reproducible build support in Debian um, and has extended support for certain core components, like time of support for bug fixes. Um, the Octo project is now capable of reproducible builds for all of its packages as well. And um, with that one-line SBOM change, having the SBOMs and the reproducible builds is probably the best known practices today for us helping to secure the infrastructure. Um, and then systems today are increasingly able to, are increasingly incorporating AI trained models. And so SPDX is working on an AI and data set profile that will let us um, summarize this information effectively and share it so we can reproduce the trained models too. Because getting all these elements, the same way you have to build your images, you have to build your models by training them, there could be vulnerabilities, there could be hazards coming out of those trained models, and we're going to need to be able to address them as well in the future for safety analysis. So we're heading there. The Civil Infrastructure Project has been exploring how to satisfy some of these requirements of infrastructure using open source systems built on Linux for several years now. And as you can see, build environment is one of the key aspects, as is safe security updates, security itself, automation of the testing, and then long-term support strategy. These are things that they've been focusing on now. So we are focusing on these in projects in the Linux Foundation. We just need to be doing it wider. Next step um, that I think we can all take today, start hardening the most important projects first. The criticality scores, the work that's been done from Harvard Lish um, to identify these projects that Jim was talking about earlier. Well, there's you know, 80 million, I think, was being said, plus out there. Which ones are important? And then you know, how can we get them hardened first. One of the obvious ones is Linux, um, and there's a lot of work going on there. Um, and because it is so common in embedded systems, it is a good make, place to make sure we are doing the best we can. Certainly, um, you know, it is being used. It comes under different names. It may get called it too, it may get called Android, Debian, um, Red Hat, Wind River. Any of these distros, underneath it's a Linux kernel. And that is, the, you know, that is something that I think making sure we have the best practices for this is going to be key. And so things that we're doing to focus dependability of Linux, well, we always, we've been putting a long-term support system in place for several years that's improving the security, maintainability, and reliability of Linux. That, um, and so certainly every year there's a new LTS declared and some of it's longer terms. Civil infrastructure um, platform is looking at how can they extend it even longer? <laughs> um, and there's good challenges there. Part of the other challenge is making sure everything is upstream. So we've been doing work in the real-time project to finish getting all the preempt RT patches upstream so there's nothing out of tree. Um, that's almost done now. And that will help improve maintainability of infrastructure and embedded that has real-time considerations. The kernel CI project is focusing on improving the testing and reliability of the kernel images. And Elisa is focusing on how do we bridge between the safety analysis world and the open source development world. And so, you know, our challenge is critical infrastructures need an operating system for these complex algorithms and software for, you know, suitable for use in safety critical systems. There have been some historical gaps between the processes used in open source and what's documented in the safety standards. So Elisa's mission is to define and maintain a common set of elements, processes, and tools to help make Linux-based safety critical systems amenable to that certification. Because we have communities that can't quite talk to each other right now. We have to build that bridge. And building the bridge you know, is a step-by-step -step process, too. So Linux 
is certainly there in the most popular places, but sometimes it's just too big. We've got um, other LF projects that are focusing on safety considerations as well. Zephyr, um, we talked about earlier, has a safety committee focused on getting ISO 61508 certification going through. The self 4 um, project is a formally verified microkernel. Um, Zen has got a special interest group working on functional safety, on making the hypervisor ready for use in mixed criticality systems. And then likewise, ACORN is also having focus on safety. Now, the Zephyr project, um, we, since we started it, we wanted to be able to go after safety critical with Zephyr, as well as the security. And so we've been putting the processes in place, a lot of them learn from Linux, um, to make sure that we have it. And we actually have a functional safety manager that's a neutral one that's been hired by the project to make sure that we can get ourselves ready for 61508, who's helping to build that bridge. Um, Zephyr's also focused on adopting security best practices. Anytime we learn about one, we try to apply it. And we were one of the early achievers of the gold badge from the um, badging program as well. Some of the other most important projects though, um, you know, how do we do figure out what the risk is of them and how do we use it? Well, the best practices badge I just referred to, there's a scorecards project, there's a supply chain level software artifacts, and then there's the Alpha Omega projects. So we've got various initiatives in OpenSSF that are gonna help us understand risk, score it, and improve, hopefully work on improving and hardening these projects as we identify them. Next step, let's establish a um, reference systems. Um, modern open source development is usually based on developers finding something similar to what they wanna use, copying it, and tweak it until it achieves their goals. Okay, by combining open source projects together without NDAs into reference systems with configurations for different criticality levels and documenting them, we will be providing new starting points. This is one of the goals of AGL. As you've seen from Dan, they wanna have these reference points. This is a very good model for us to start to build from. Similarly, um, civil infrastructure is also putting together reference points. And I will also say that um, LF Edge as their various blueprints and networking has blueprints. Again, putting these references together and making sure they're following the best practice is things we can build off of and then others can build from and have more better chances of getting it right. So, during this year, um, the ELISA project formed a new systems working group. And our goal in this group is to work with these comp components, open source components, and create mixed criticality systems doing applications. And so in June earlier this year, we actually have Linux, Zen, and um, Zephyr hooked together in mixed criticality, interacting and configured. And we're working with AGL to get AGL and Yocto integrated as part of this whole system. So this is work in progress. And if people are interested, please come talk to me more about this later. Um, the other step we can be taking today, education for open source developers, as we referred to earlier, making sure that the developers understand security, safety, and system engineering, and the implications of system engineering um, is a good start here. We've added a software engineering basics for embedded systems course, as well as the security courses that Jim and others have referred to, um, the development, so secure software development fundamentals. These are all freely available for developers to take. And with Elisa, we're trying to make all of our learnings visible as well. And so, you know, there's virtual workshops and the videos from those are all freely available on YouTube for you to catch up if you have not, were not able to attend them. And we have periodic webinars deep diving into special topics. So if you're interested in learning more about the system side of things, uh, we will be having a mini summit tomorrow here. And um, we'll be going into a deep dive on the systems working group as well as the automotive working group. So if this is a topic of interest to you, I'd encourage you to sign up. And, uh, we can take it from there. So, as you see, we are going to need a step-by-step -step evolution, not a revolution, to get the open source ecosystem working well with the critical infrastructure systems. This pre presentation went over some of the initial steps we can take now, but there's gonna be more needed in the future. We don't know the full roadmap yet, but you can sort of see there are things we can do now to make it better. Um, Japan has a tremendous expertise and leadership in effective system engineering. And I hope 
that as Japan's critical infrastructure systems evolve and adopt more open source components themselves, that they will share their expertise and lessons learned with the wider open source ecosystem communities as well. This will help improve software quality, reliability, maintainability, security, and safety for us all. Thank you. Arigatou gozaimasu.